Hello and welcome to Financial Statement and Analysis Lecture 8. Today's topic is valuation part one and today's topic finally gets us up to the valuation step in our business analysis framework. So in the course so far we have started with understanding the business. We've done a economic analysis, an industry analysis and a business strategy analysis that allowed us to understand what really drives the business's performance. Then we had a close look at the financial statements to make sure that they made sense and we then calculated a bunch of ratios which helped us forecast the future performance of the business. Now that we've completed our forecasting, we're going to use our forecast information to actually apply the valuation models and come up with a value for our businesses. There are a lot of different ways that we can value businesses. In this course, we're going to cover five different methodologies. In today's lecture, we're going to cover these first two. We're going to look at the price multiples method and the dividend discount model. In next week's lecture, we're going to cover the discounted abnormal earnings, discounted abnormal operating earnings, and discounted cash flow models. These valuation models do value slightly different things. Some of the valuation models will value the equity of the firm, while others will value the total assets of the firm, that is the equity plus liabilities of the firm. We'll talk more about that as we get into the models. But at this point, I want you to know we're going to cover five models in this subject. There's no best model. The price multiples is not going to be used in our assignment. It is a very quick and inaccurate method of doing evaluation. Very commonly used, so we're going to talk about it and we're going to learn how to calculate it, but it won't be part of our assignment. For our assignment, we're going to calculate these four valuation methods. So today, the discounted dividend model. Next week, the following three models. Let's start with the most popular valuation method. The price multiples method is by far and away the most commonly used method that people use to try and get a value of a company. The price multiples method is very popular because it's very easy and simple to apply. These are three steps that are often used when looking at price multiples. First of all, you select a multiple that you're willing to use, such as the PE ratio, which means price to earnings ratio, the price to sales ratio, or maybe the price to book ratio. The price to book ratio is also called the market to book MB ratio as well. So we select a ratio that we think is going to be useful for valuing our business. We calculate this ratio or multiple for other firms that are in our industry or our competitor firms. And we see what our firm's ratio is compared to the competitors. And we say, well, maybe our company's ratio should be more similar to the competitors. And we'll apply the competitors ratio to our company's financial statement information to get a valuation. Okay, so it's a very simple way of looking at the value of a company. Here's an example from the Penman textbook on how to apply some price multiples. We've got three companies listed that are all operating in the IT hardware space. So we've got Hewlett Packard, Lenovo and Dell. They all make computers as a uh, product that they're competent in. We've got from their financial statements, their sales revenue, their earnings or net profit and their book value. That's the book value of equity or the total owner's equity on the balance sheet. Then we've got the market value. The market value is the number of shares the company has times the price per share. It's also called the market capitalization. Based on this information, we can then calculate these three ratios, the price to sales, price to earnings, and price to book ratios. To calculate the price to sales ratio for Hewlett Packard, we know their sales revenue and we know their market price. So we take the market price 115,700 and we divide through by the sales revenue of 84,229 and that gives us a price to sales ratio of 1.37. Similar process for the price to earnings ratio. We take the price that is the market value of the company or the market capitalization and we divide through by the net profit. Price to book ratio. We take the price of the company and we divide through by their total owner's equity that's on the balance sheet, the book value. And we get the ratios. We do the same thing for the next company, Lenovo. So then when we look at Dell's financial statements, we know their sales, earnings and book values. We can then try and calculate their ratios to come up with a market value. There's multiple ways we could do it. In this example, we're going to use Hewlett Packard and Lenovo as their industry competitors. And we're going to take an average of the industry ratios and apply that to get a evaluation for Dell. So, for Hewlett Packard and Lenovo, they've got a price to sales ratio of 1.37 and 0.44. If we average those, these two numbers, we would get a 
average multiple of 0 0.91. We would then multiply Dell's sales by 0 0.91 to get an estimate of what their market value would be if we applied the average price to sales ratio of their competitors to come up with their valuation. We can do the same for the price to earnings and price to book ratios. So we take these two price to earnings ratios and we come up with an average. The average price to earnings ratio for the industry is 27.8. We multiply Dell's earnings by the average ratio to get their valuation. And we do the same with the book to value ratio as well. Now we've come up with three wildly different valuations from a low of 16 billion all the way up to a high of 81 billion. Now, if this valuation was going to be used for important purposes, for example, Dell was going to be bought out by one of these as a competitor, the difference between paying $16 billion for a company and $81 billion for a company is so huge. It makes the, the valuations here so highly inaccurate that they're not very useful. It was quick for us to do. It was easy for us to do, but it was wildly inaccurate. It gives us some base estimates of what could be realistic values. So in this case, we've then taken an average of these three estimates as well to get an average valuation of $51 billion. So in about two minutes flat, we have valued Dell computers. However, obviously it's not gonna be that easy to value all companies in such a quick and easy fashion. There are lots of problems with using the price multiples method. First of all, selecting your comparable firms is gonna be difficult. Even if we have three companies like Dell, Lenovo, and HP that sell similar products, they may have slightly different business models. They may have different business strategies within the same market. So if they have different strategies and they're earning different price uh, profit margins and asset turnover ratios are different, then the price multiples may also end up being very different. In that case, we often use industry averages, but if the firm you're trying to value has some characteristics that are different to the industry, then the industry average wouldn't be very applicable to your firm. We need to also consider some firms have poor performance. Often a firm might have a low PE ratio, their price to earnings ratio might be low this year because there is an expectation in the market that the company's earnings will decrease in the future. So firms with poor performance might have legitimate reasons to have lower price multiples than their competitors. So applying an average may not be appropriate if we expect your firm will not actually perform as an average competitor. They may be underperforming the market. We should also consider things like earnings management. If we just apply price multiples, we don't have to do our accounting analysis. We may not have uncovered any problems with the accounting. So if we just trust the book value or trust the net profit figures, we're excluding the possibility of uncovering any accounting issues that may be making those numbers biased either up or down. So when we then apply our price multiple, it would lead to inaccuracies as well. Another example of a problem with the price multiples is the fact that it doesn't take into account different businesses having different financial activities. When we did reformatting of the financial statements and when we did ratio analysis, we learned that a business's performance, its return on equity, is heavily dependent on both its operating performance and its financing performance, its financial leverage and its spread. So if we combine two, if we compare two different companies that are in the same industry that are selling similar products and have the same business strategy, but if their financing arrangements are very different, we would expect them to have very different performance. The price multiples method doesn't take into account that different businesses, even though they may look similar, they may have very different financing, which will lead to very different returns on equity earned by those shareholders. So in conclusion on price multiples, Price multiples is the most commonly used valuation metric. If you go to any of the financial websites, such as Yahoo Finance, for example, you'll see that they have calculated the price to earnings ratio, the market to book ratio, and a couple of other different price multiples for every company that's listed on the stock market. It's very quick. Everyone can look at this data very easily, and it gives us a very rough estimate. It's used as a rule of thumb to get quick, easy valuations, but we know that they're probably not going to be very accurate. For example, we can say an industry average price to earnings multiple is 15. So if we look at our company's profit and it's a million dollars, we'd say, okay, 
it should the value of the company should be 15 times their profit. So this this business that has a profit of $1 million should be valued at $15 million. Now, that's making a lot of assumptions about the growth of the business and the accounting being accurate that we haven't actually evaluated. So it's quick, it's easy, but it can be highly inaccurate because we haven't actually done any hard work to try and find out the, the real nuance of the business. So price multiples didn't require us to do any comprehensive forecasting. It didn't allow us to, it didn't require us to have any cost of capital estimates. It didn't require us to do our reformatting and splitting up the operating and financing activities to uncover what the actual value generation of the business is. And we didn't even have to have an understanding of the business. The databases can calculate these ratios for us and spit out a very quick price multiple ratio, which we could then apply to the valuation. So with that in mind, we don't want you to use the price multiples method as a basis for your company's valuation report. We are now going to look at the dividend discount model. So the dividend discount model is a really nice application of our standard valuation theory. The standard valuation theory says that the value of an asset is the net present value of future cash flows. In lecture one, we looked at this formula, the present value formula equals the cash flow divided by one plus our cost of capital to the power of however many time periods we need to discount it back. So net present value, we add up all the different present value cash flows that a company or bond or any other sort of thing that we're going to value requires. This valuation theory works really well for things like valuing a bond. Valuing a bond is relatively easy because it's easy to apply the net present value concept. The future cash flows, they are contractual. We enter into a contract with whoever the borrower and the lender is, and we know what the coupon and principal pay payments will be. We know how many coupon payments will be made. We know exactly which months those coupon payments will be made, and we know the amount of every coupon payment. Additionally, we then know when the principal will be repaid. So all the cash flows are known with, relatively cer with relative certainty. The cost of debt capital is also contracted. If I'm going to lend you some money, you want to get a loan from me, I would say, okay, I'll give you this loan, but I want you to pay me 7% interest. If you say yes, we've now got a contract, and I know that your cost of debt capital is 7% for this particular. So when we do our discounting, we use the 7% interest rate. If you say no to my offer of 7%, and you go somewhere else, and someone else offers you a 6% interest rate, then your cost of debt capital for that particular loan would be 6%. So when we look at this formula, when we're valuing bonds, the cash flows are known, and the R, the required rate of return, is the interest rate that we've entered into our contract on. We know how many time periods we need to discount back, so the valuation, the net present value, is relatively straightforward. Now, there is a risk of bankruptcy occurring for a company, so they may not pay back the debt. So there are a few nuances there and a few difficulties in trying to figure out if the company is likely to go bankrupt or not. That could change our value of the bond as well. But for the most part, valuing a bond is relatively straightforward. Valuing a company, on the other hand, is much more difficult. There's all sorts of new difficulties added into the process because the future cash flows, that is the dividends the company pay out, are variable. The number, timing, and amount of dividends is unknown. The cost of capital for equity is really difficult to estimate. And similar to a bond, the risk of bankruptcy also does change throughout the time of the business. So dividends are set by the board of directors of a company. And the board of directors will make a decision every, say, six months or every year about, are they going to pay a dividend? If so, how much will the dividend be? Some companies that are very successful choose not to pay dividends. The most famous example is Berkshire Hathaway, which is run by Warren Buffett, who's one of the richest guys in the world. He does not pay dividends. He says that investors give him money and he's going to invest their money on their behalf. So it doesn't make sense for him to then give the money back to them. If they want money from the investment, they can sell the shares. So he keeps all the money investors give and he invests it into productive businesses for them. So valuing Berkshire Hathaway, which is one of the most valuable companies in the world, is difficult with the dividend discount model because the company does not pay dividends. Other, on the other end of the spectrum, small growing companies that are making losses will not be paying dividends. So again, we have to forecast a long time into the future to try and think about when will dividends actually be paid? How much will they be? 
it makes it a little bit more difficult to value a company when the dividends are uncertain. So we're gonna value the company using a dividend discount model. The dividend discount model is an application of net present value techniques. We're going to present value future cash flows that shareholders expect to get. This is gonna be the basis for, or the theoretical basis for all the subsequent valuation models that we learned. So the dividend discount model is going to be the basis for all the other valuation models. If we go and do all the algebra, they all derive from this particular model. This model does have really good sound theoretical concepts. It values the equity of a firm because the dividends are what the equity holders of the firm actually get, their physical cash flow. And we're gonna discount using the cost of capital for equity. Here's the formula for the dividend discount model. It says the value of a firm's equity. Next week, when we learn different valuation models, the notation can be a little bit different. So here we've got value and little subscript E means we're valuing the firm's equity. Next week, we'll also be valuing the total firm value. Okay, so we won't have the E subscript, we'll have value of the firm, which means we'll then use cost of capital for equity if we're valuing the equity. Next week, when we're doing some valuation models that value the total assets of the firm, we'll get the cost of capital for the whole firm. Okay, dividend discount model, we're valuing the equity of the firm. The value of the equity is equal to the dividend in year one divided by one plus the cost of capital for equity plus the dividend in year two divided by one plus the cost of capital of equity to the power of second year dividend, we discount it back by two periods. All we're doing is for each year, we're expecting a cash flow that is a dividend and we're using the net present value formula. Divide the cash flow by one plus the cost of capital to the power of however many time periods you're discounting it back. At the end, we then have this term plus the terminal value, TV stands for terminal value, and we discount the terminal value back to period zero. So we've got the steps here to do the dividend discount model. We forecast net dividends up to a forecast horizon. In our forecasting template that we looked at in two weeks ago, we forecast the dividends that we expect our companies to pay out. So step one, when we've completed our forecast template, we actually have our forecast dividends. That is the net payments to shareholders. We then need to estimate the cost of capital for equity we're gonna be looking at estimating the cost of capital for equity in lecture 10. So at this point, we're just gonna use any old number for our cost of capital of equity. We're just gonna guess a number in week 10. We're then gonna learn how do we can do some estimation methods for this. We then discount future dividends to the present value. We know each dividend from our forecast template. We have estimated our cost of capital for equity. So we now just figure out these calculations. Step four is forecast the dividend growth patterns beyond the forecast. So if we have forecast five years of dividends, for example, but we expect the company is going to operate for more than five years, step four says we need to do something with our terminal value. Do we think the dividends will continue to be paid further out than five years? And if so, will they continue to grow? So we have to make one of these choices. After five years, we could assume the dividend is gonna be zero. That is the company will be wound up or it will be unsuccessful. We can assume the company is going to continue paying the same dividend from year five every year in perpetuity. Or we can assume that the year five dividend will grow by some sort of constant rate. Okay, so there's gonna be some sort of percentage growth, such as the dividend will grow by 2% every year. That allows us then for step five to calculate the terminal value at the forecast horizon. We then, so calculating this terminal value. Step six, we then discount the terminal value because we're calculating the terminal value, for example, in year six, we then need to discount it six years to get. We add up all of these different terms to get the total value of our firm's equity. The only real difficulty to the dividend discount model is getting our terminal value assumptions right. And that is actually, when we go into practice and do this, it's an incredibly difficult thing to get our terminal value assumptions right. From a modeling point of view, there's three different calculations that we can choose. So. We know that forecasting multiple years into the future is hard, and we know that we can't forecast 100 years into the future. The company may still be around in 100 years, and it may still be paying dividends in 100 years' time. So we want to have some sort of simplifying assumption to capture this. That is what our terminal value assumption is. So we do our forecasting for a finite number of years. For example, I suggest forecast about five years into the future for your assignment. After five years, you're going to calculate a terminal value and the terminal value is 
going to be the present value of dividends occurring beyond the terminal year, and you have to make one of these three choices. The terminal value could be zero. For example, if I'm forecasting a gold mining company and they have a gold mine and I expect they'll run out of gold in six years time, and then after that, the business will not be generating any free cash flow or paying dividends, it would be fair to assume that dividends will be zero after the gold mine runs out of gold. If I'm forecasting that my business is likely to go bankrupt in five or six years, I could put a terminal value of zero, and that would make sense. However, if I think my business is going to survive into the future and continue in paying dividends, a terminal value of zero dividends does not make sense. So we'd then look at one of the next two options. We could think that the dividend payment will stay constant, such as every year this share will pay $1 in dividends, and that's going to happen from year five until forever. Or we could say, up until year five, we think the dividends will be $1 per share, but afterwards we think they're gonna grow by 2% per year. The formulas for these three assumptions look like this. Case one, when we're assuming the terminal value of zero, that is the company is going to finish up, the gold mine runs out of gold, or we expect the company to go bankrupt or be unsuccessful and no longer be able to generate free cash flow to pay dividends. We have all our cash flows for each year, so our cash flows discounted for each year. Then when we get to our final year, we have our final year cash flow and we discount it back as normal and then it stops. There's no more after that year. We have zero dividends, which we don't have to discount back or add into the model because the business is no longer generating dividends. Case two is called a perpetuity. And that's when we expect a dividend to be paid all the way into the future forever, but that dividend will be the same number, the same dividend payment every year into the future. So we expect this would happen maybe in a really competitive industry. Uh, the business has got a certain market share. We don't expect the market to grow. We don't expect the business to grow their market share. So they're going to be very consistent. For example, if we were valuing a car park maybe, and the car park has a certain capacity constraint, only 100 cars can park every day. And it's a competitive industry, so we don't expect our uh, ability to increase our price will be possible. So we could expect that dividends would be very constant into the future. There's not going to be any exponential growth because we've reached capacity in our business. Okay, so the maths looks like this. Again, we've got our net present value formulas. Each year we're discounting our dividends. Then at this point in time when we're doing the terminal value, we do this calculation here. Our dividend is divided through by the cost of capital. This is called a perpetuity calculation. Now I want you to note we are not doing one plus the cost of capital, we are just dividing through by the cost of capital. So if our cost of capital was 8% and we've got our dividend of $1, we'll do $1 divided by 0 0.08. That calculates a perpetuity and that would be the total terminal value of all the future dividends discounted at. However, the terminal value might have been done in year five. So then we have to do a normal discounting, take it back, take this terminal value from year five money into present value. So this multiplied by one over one plus R to the power of T is just applying the normal present value calculation. The terminal value might be calculated in a year such as year five. So then we need to do a normal present value on the terminal value calculation as well. This example was a terminal value in perpetuity we divide the dividend by the cost of capital to come up with a perpetuity. We then discount that perpetuity value to get a present value of the perpetuity. We then add all the other discounted cash flows to get the total value of the firm. Case three assumes the dividend will grow in perpetuity. So this time we've got growth built into our model. We forecast our dividends for a couple of years. Then afterwards, we assume the dividends will grow by a certain amount or certain percentage every year. We might say the dividends are expected to grow by 2% every year because we think the company will grow at the same rate as the broad economy at 2% forever. So we do our normal net present value calculations. Then when we get to our terminal value year, we have our terminal value, or sorry, we have our dividend from last year, x to the t, x at time t, we multiply it by one plus our growth rate. So if our dividend this year was $1 per share, and we think the dividend is gonna grow by 2%, we'd say our $1 per share times one plus 2% growth would give us a dividend of $1.02 this year. We then divide through by the cost of capital minus the growth rate. 
Now, remember, there should be some brackets around this cost of capital minus the growth rate to make sure the formula works out as well. And that gives us our terminal value with growth. We've calculated this terminal value with growth in year five or six. We then do the normal present value calculation. Okay, we discount back our terminal value to get the discounted or the present value of our terminal value. So they're the calculations for the dividend discount model. I've showed you the formula for the dividend discount model, and I've shown you the three different terminal value assumptions that can be made. What we'll do next is I'll go through a demonstration of how you actually apply this model in Excel using the Gale Pacific example, so that you can have a look how it all works in ca uh, calculating all those little parts of the formula. So if you are worried about the maths and you think the formula looks confusing, as we go through step by step in the formula, you'll see it's a pretty simple process to follow through each of those steps. So we now have the valuation model. We know the formula. We're going to look at how to apply that formula to a demonstration company with Gale Pacific. What are the theoretical problems with the dividend discount model? Why am I going to bother teaching you three other models next week? Well, there are some problems with the dividend discount model. It's not perfect. And those three models next week will hopefully improve upon some of the issues with the dividend discount model. So first of all, dividends are distributions of value. They don't represent the creation of value. When we did the reformatting topic, we looked at how the operations of the business actually create value. The dividends that a company pay are not necessarily linked to the actual operations creating value in the business. Companies that are not creating much value can actually go and borrow money from the bank and use that to pay out dividends. So their dividends might be higher than the actual value they're creating in a given year. So that could be an issue. For those of you that have studied finance, the Medigliana and Miller theorem, m, &M which I briefly mentioned in lecture one, it states that dividend policy is irrelevant to valuation in an efficient market. They put forward all these arguments that if an investor does not want to receive a dividend, they shouldn't be paid a dividend. And then investors that do want to receive a dividend, they need cash flow, they could sell off a portion of the shares they own in their company, and that creates a cash flow for them that is equivalent to the dividend. So with some mathematically mathematical modeling, they showed that these two states are pretty much equivalent. Dividends are irrelevant to the valuation of a company. And now we're using it as a way of valuing a company. So there's a little bit of a theoretical uh, disconnect there. It's a contradiction. So the other valuation models will hopefully overcome this problem. Dividend policy can be arbitrary. As I mentioned before, Warren Buffett runs a very successful company and he does not pay dividends in his company. Some very unsuccessful companies are still paying dividends in bad years. So dividend, value, dividend payout is arbitrary. The board of directors can make up their minds as they go and it's not linked to the earnings directly or the cash flows or the value creation of the company. The final point here, when we look at the terminal value calculations, the dividend discount model is very, very sensitive to the terminal value calculation. And from a practical point of view, the terminal value calculation is actually the hardest number to get correct. When we're trying to forecast the terminal value number, we're trying to forecast from say year five out to infinity. That's gonna be the hardest number to get correct. Forecasting next year's performance is much harder than forecasting five or six years into the future. So from a practical point of view, the valuation is very sensitive to the most difficult number to forecast. So that concludes our theoretical discussion of price multiples and the dividend discount model. I'm now going to do a demonstration using Gale Pacific and how to calculate price multiples for them and how to do the dividend discount model, looking at the three different terminal value assumptions. Next week, we're going to look at the residual income model. We're gonna look at the residual operating income model and the discounted cash flow model. These are three more advanced valuation methods that have a lot in common because they're all derived from the dividend discount model. The way we set up our spreadsheets and the way we discount things will be very similar. We'll just be discounting different numbers instead of dividends to hopefully come up with some more accurate valuations of our companies. Thank you very much, and I'll talk to you guys next week.